Pete Hunt from uh, Mutuo. And uh, as Melina says um, very kindly, we've been uh, working with BCCM since it was established in 2013, trying to help to work out the strategic approach to building this better business environment. And um, I'm actually really, uh, I was going to start with a joke about cricket, but that's all blown, isn't it? Um, <laughs> So forget that, just take it as read. Um, so, um, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll be a bit more serious instead, and I'll sort of reflect on what um, Greg has said, really, because uh, you see the title. Um, in lots of ways, you know, what I'm trying to do in, in this slot is to help with a bit of self-confidence, because um, my experience in working in lots of different countries uh, with different types of cooperatives and mutuals is that there is very often uh, a feeling of what you might call a bunker mentality, um, where people have felt, possibly even for their entire careers, that they have been on the receiving end of a pretty bad deal. Poor legislation, inappropriate policy, possibly regulation that doesn't fit the type of business that they are. And so, uh, in lots of ways, you know, they uh, might, I, I see people who, who don't have you know, a lot of self-confidence about the type of business that we are. But, but we can actually be more confident. Um, I mean, the first thing to say is that getting landmark legislation is no small achievement. You know, this is a, a big deal for the Australian uh, mutual sector. Um, and it fits into uh, an international context, which is changing, and it's changing in our favor. It's moving, the tide has turned from what you might have described as the sort of you know, Chicago school attitude to business economics of the 80s and 90s. You know? And you know, if I can say it, assisted by the GFC, um, people are starting to at least pause and think of what type of businesses they want in different uh, sectors. Uh, and so governments are much more open to these types of conversations. So we've got a job to do in terms of you know, representing mutuals and representing different types of uh, mutual businesses to be able to be positive about why we're here, less apologetic about uh, our types uh, of firms, understand the identity questions um, and have good answers in the elevator when we're asked um, why we're here, what we're trying to achieve, and what's different uh, about us. So um, I'm going to um, run through a few slides with you. Um, just to say, by the way, you're going to get spoken at for the first two um, um, parts of this, this day, but the rest of it is very much more interactive. Uh, so you will get an opportunity to ask questions and make comments as we go through. Um, but I'm going to give you some um, perspectives from how different, um, different types of mutuals, different types of co-ops in different jurisdictions around the world have approached exactly the same question. Um, and it is this, you know, we're all familiar with it, which is the mutual capital conundrum. So how can you get external capital into a mutual? without either demutualizing or in some way ceding member control, you know, changing the purpose you know, of the business. Um, um, and we all know, you know customer-owned mutuals and co-ops, you know, they, they exist for their members. You know, it's all about providing the best service. It's all about providing the best price um, to them. And of course, if you bring external capital into the picture, it's got to be paid for. You know, there's a price to pay for every different uh, stakeholder uh, relationship. Um, and of course, you know, traditionally, you know, people put capital into a business because they want to make some money out of their investment. They would like it to appreciate. They would like to get some kind of dividend payment. Um, and so you can see why you know, this has always been a big problem for mutuals. You, know, you, you don't want to have these two competing ideas of focusing on the customers, focusing on those people, and at the same time having to service them. But you know, what do you do? You know, you're in a, a marketplace, if you're an ADI, for example, which is dominated by very large businesses with access to shareholder capital, 
digitization alone is a massive uh, financial investment. And so where are you going to get the money from? You're traditionally reliant on um, uh, retained earnings and debt. But there's a limit to that. And it means that you can build capital over a long period of time, but actually you can't access it quickly. So, yeah, why not just demutualize, yeah? Um, I mean, in this audience, you know, it shouldn't be a question that people don't have an answer to. Um, but demutualization is an option. You can just give up as a mutual, and you can say, okay, we're just going to play with the other, other guys, and we're going to uh, participate in the same way as they do. But what is the actual problem with demutualization? And I, I know in this audience, you know, you can, I can get 30 answers straight away, but let's ask it, because these are the elevator pitches that we're going to need to respond to. These are the things we're going to need to be able to justify ourselves around why should we be mutuals? Why should we be uh, different? Um, well, look, let's, what's the likely outcome if you demutualize? You know, this is probably the best way of, um, of, of, of looking at this. I'll just submit two pieces of evidence. Um, let's pick an Australian example. Um, easy peasy, AMP. Um, so it's a governance basket case. It's been involved in mis-selling. It's corporate behavior has fallen short. It's all public on the record. Um, it's stock price has tanked. Um, it's not a successful example uh, of a insurance business. Um, but it demutualized from being one of the great names of um, the Australian financial services market. Um, and some people benefited greatly at the point of demutualization, um, but mostly um, the senior executives, actually. Um, and yes, the members got paid some money. Um, but over time, the value has been dissipated. Um, and so people look wistfully at AMP and saying, well, you know, would it have been different if it stayed mutual? You know, would it have tried to take over a business that it couldn't actually handle? Would it have done things differently? Would it have behaved differently? You know, look at the Royal Commission last year. You know, it wasn't mutuals in the dock. So there is something to be said for behaviors being different when the pressures on executives are different. Another um, piece of evidence around demutualization, I'll pick it from the UK. In the early 80s, 80% 80 of the mortgage market was um, uh, controlled by building societies, mutuals, and someone had a great idea to permit them to demutualize. Legislation was passed. These are all old-fashioned, old granny organizations. Let's do something that's more modern and give them a chance to be uh, banks like everybody else. And so the short version of the story is that they uh, demutualized the vast majority of, by size anyway, of the building society sector uh, to the point that today it's 20% of the uh, mortgage uh, and savings market. Uh, and in that process, over a very short period of time, the independence of the businesses was lost. They merged into other super entities. We ended up with four big banks, and in one day, the whole lot collapsed. It all collapsed. It cost 80 billion pounds of taxpayers' money in 24 hours. And this is the context. This is the context of this consideration. You know, you've got competing issues to take uh, account of. It's not an easy decision. And so, you know, going back to what Greg has just said about what you're going to use the investment for, that is a really, really important question. Um, and how can we do this in a sensible way? How can we do this in a way that is, is meaningful? So we have always been told, there goes my name, that um, people demutualize because they need more capital. Um, and they tend to need more capital for their plans for growth. If you need more capital to stand still, then there's another question to answer. Um, but they need more capital. So this capital conundrum for mutuals is the question that we've been uh, working on. 
you're not alone. This is an international um, issue. Mutuals all around the world have very similar structures, not identical, but very similar structures. They have very similar legal frameworks, but they do have slightly different um, policy and regulatory environments, which I can sort of say one or two things about as we go through uh, this. Um, but Capital 101, everybody in the room knows it. Um, companies and mutuals, all types of corporates, will access capital through debt or through investment. Um, and they're different. They behave differently. You have different obligations. You have different uh, relationships uh, as a result of that. Um, and shares in the company, we all know this. They give shareholders a proportionate number of votes. You buy 100 shares, you get 100 votes. You buy 1,000 shares, you get 1,000 votes. So you get influence when you um, buy shares in a company. Um, you get an entitlement to a share in the profits, and you get an entitlement to a proportionate share in the underlying value of the company. So we all know what shareholding is supposed to mean. But capital in mutuals is different, and it's different in three respects. Lawyers would probably find 10, but um, I'll say three. <coughs> so each member has one vote, no more than one vote. This is a crucial part of the relationship because this is linked to the purpose of the business. This is why, the reason they have it, it's not some historic anachronism, it's deliberate. It's so that there is no disproportionate um, relationship with any stakeholder. It's meant to be like that. Um, so irrespective of you know, how much business you do with it, how much um, you might have invested in it, you get one vote. Um, and the profits are treated equitably. Now, this is one of those sort of lawyers love this. Um, so it means that you treat the profits differently than you do in a straightforward company. Um, it's not a reward for investors. You pay what you have to pay in terms of um, any capital contributed. But that isn't the purpose of the business. As I said, the purpose is the service and the price to the customer owner of the business. And so treating them equitably um, is important. And I'll come back to that because when we talk about how you pay dividends on MCIs or instruments like that, you know, the way of approaching it is different from um, what you might think. Um, and crucially, the member has and shouldn't have, and it was never the intention in a mutual that they would have a right to the underlying value of the business. In a way, you know, members, today's members of all mutuals are custodians of the value of the business for the next generation. Um, and what's happened with demutualization is that um, the law has permitted today's members to effectively cash out on the investment that's been put in over generations. And mostly they don't care because they get the money. Um, but the truth is that wasn't the intention of the business and no mutual was established when the first laws were written with the intention of this cash out um, of a particular group of members at a particular group of time. So you're not supposed to have you know, that kind of view of ownership. It's a different kind of view of ownership, um, of common ownership. And you know, for what it's worth, I would say that when you talk to um, people who don't really understand mutuals, this is something they really struggle to get their head around because the sort of Anglo-Saxon idea of ownership is, you know, that's my bottle, that's my table, that's my phone, I can trade it, I can sell it. And the idea of it being held in common is just like mind-blowing to lots of people. And it's not taught in schools, it's not taught in universities, but you go to different parts of the world, it's completely normal and completely understood. So back to the conundrum. So if these are the characteristics of a mutual, well, what are we doing here? You know, why are we even having this conversation? If we're introducing external capital, what does it do to the balance and the purpose of the organization? Isn't it a huge risk? Isn't it dangerous? Are we playing with fire? Are we demutualizing through the back door? Or are we facing some realities in all of this? So today, you look around the room, okay? There's 100 people 
in this room. Um, that's because of the size of the sector. Okay, maybe we could have had 150, but that's basically the size of the sector. Um, 30 years ago, we'd have needed the room over the other side, much bigger. 50 years ago, maybe a different venue altogether because the sector has been uh, suffering from demutualization, it's been experiencing consolidation, there are fewer mutuals, and in the markets that many of us are working, there's been you know, a great move towards sort of super companies as the competitors. And so the reality of that experience is that doing nothing isn't really an option. Sticking to the plan that you know, Victorian uh, founders of mutuals had doesn't really work in a modern context. It doesn't work in banking because you can't actually compete uh, on the same level. And so we have to do something. And in trying to answer this conundrum, this question has been approached in lots of different uh, countries too. So I don't think doing nothing's an answer. We've got to do something. We've got to do something reasonable. We've got to do something that doesn't upset the apple cart, that doesn't stop or it affects the way that mutuals are focused. And so this was the approach that we took uh, with this legislation. So I'm just going to run through a few examples of where mutuals in different parts of the world have approached the same question or are dealing with the same questions. The good thing is that none of this is on a template. You can't just say, oh, I want the Canada version, please, and apply it to Australia. It's going to be your own um, unique approach. It's got to fit the culture, it's got to fit the market, it's got to fit the legal, and very importantly, the policy and regulatory environment for your country, because it's different in these different places. And I'll, as I go through the examples, you'll, you'll probably get the idea of why. So, in the UK, after the GFC, um, the government thought, oh, that wasn't very good. Um, we probably need to have a different attitude to the mutual sector because it wasn't the mutual sector that needed bailing out with taxpayers' money. Across the whole of Europe, you know, the performance of cooperatively and member-owned um, uh, banks, for example, um, was completely um, at odds with the uh, listed um, businesses. Um, and most importantly, it didn't need bailing out. So there's something different about these. You know, the penny's starting to drop, but there is something different about the behaviors of these kinds of firms. And so um, they decided in the UK, the Bank of England and the Treasury together, to legislate to permit building societies to do two things, to try to achieve two things. Firstly, to be able to raise capital quickly so that they were not under such stress, um, but secondly, to acknowledge that this conundrum which had been created needed some kind of um, uh, way of, of, of being got around. Um, and it was a big development uh, for mutuals, um, and the idea of core capital deferred shares, it's always snappy, um, was uh, invented. Um, so I'm going to give you uh, examples of two institutions that have approached this in different ways. And the bottom line there will probably freak you out. Yeah, 10.25%. But what Nationwide Building Society were doing was firstly doing something completely new, completely novel, um, but also um, approaching uh, the... Uh, investment markets um, in the, for the first time uh, from a uh, big mutual uh, perspective. Um, and so these core capital deferred shares are permanent shares. Very similar, actually of all the examples I've got for you, these are the most similar to MCI, but they're not exactly the same. Um, common equity tier one, tick the box. Um, and 
over two issuances. Nationwide have now um, uh, issued over a billion pounds to the wholesale market. The legislation allows it to be either wholesale or retail, but no one's done retail yet in the UK. Um, to give liquidity, they have a secondary listing. Um, so the big investors, I think when the first 500 million pounds was issued, there were 13 purchasers. Um, and to allow them to have liquidity, Nationwide then did a secondary listing. And you can see that this is now trading on the London Stock Exchange. Um, and the thing that will make your eyes bulge is that it was 10.25%, which is very expensive uh, capital. Um, as a proportion of their balance sheet, this is still very small because Nationwide is a systemically important business. It's, I think, 7% of the uh, UK banking market, something like that. Um, and actually, um, like I say, uh, because they were first, because it was new, um, it was very pricey. Um, one that might be a bit less um, frightening in terms of numbers was the way that Cambridge Building Society, a smaller regional building society, approached the very same point. Um, and they just wanted to raise 15 million pounds. Um, actually, I think they spent it on their digitization uh, program. Um, and they placed... They, they, they managed to get a placement for their investment from one investor, which is the Cambridge County Council Pension Fund. Very strong local affinity between a regional building society and a big uh, local employer's pension fund. Um, and this starts to show that um, they had lower transaction costs, uh, they were after less money, um, but at 5.25%, um, also very reasonable uh, access to that capital. So these two examples of the CCDS, very different. What they tell you, firstly, is that actually it really depends on the institution as much as anything else. Um, and it also depends on how you go about the offering. So there's no single answer to anybody uh, in this room. It will be different uh, for all of you. Um, Another very large institution is Rabobank, and Rabobank have, um, for many years, issued member certificates to their members. Um, and uh, a few years ago, they decided to open this up to the wholesale markets too, took the word member off, so they have certificates which are available wholesale and retail. Um, and they've got about 7.5 billion euros out in this uh, type of capital. Um, now, you know, it's not the same as an MCI because Technically, I guess it's debt, but it's, um, it's a perpetual bond. So it behaves um, differently from normal uh, debt in that respect. Um, and also to assist with liquidity, they, all, they do themselves have a listing on uh, Euronext, um, where it's currently trading at 122% of the uh, nominal value. Um, but then you look at the price there, big rubber bank, people very familiar with it, people very comfortable with the institution. Um, minimum 6.5% return, but their distribution policy is for Dutch government rate plus 1.5%. So again, you know, you can see the sorts of uh, numbers being very different um, from uh, nationwide. Um, uh, you might know about Desjardins in Canada. Desjardins is a federation of credit unions. Um, they've got about 70% of the market of banking in Quebec. Um, so very important business in French Canada. They operate across the whole of Canada, but they're really concentrated in Quebec. And um, they have gone down the route of seeking investment through their members. Uh, and so they've issued federation shares, which is entirely retail, no wholesale investment whatsoever, but they've got away over four billion Canadian dollars um, through their members who have um, been able to buy um, these shares, typically about two or three thousand dollars Canadian each, so very modest investments, um, and paying 4.25 percent 
Um, I'm whizzing through these because we could probably spend an hour or so on each of the different examples. But to give you an idea of the different approaches, there are other mutuals in other parts of the world already doing this kind of stuff. Um, and then recently, um, uh, entirely copying us, uh, the Singapore government um, passed legislation to permit their mutual insurer to take in uh, this type of permanent capital. Being Singapore, it's different, of course, in that they then limited it to the uh, corporate owners of the cooperative insurer, which is NTUC Income. But you can see that you're not alone. UK, Canada, Netherlands, Singapore. I know the English side of Canada are looking at this uh, at the moment. There are active discussions in the United States uh, around this kind of approach. So, you know, and we could have picked some French examples too. Um, Belgium, I put that in only because, because it is a debt instrument, you know, plain vanilla debt. But what, what's interesting about it is that it qualifies as solvency capital because their regulator has a different view. And this shows that there is a different policy um, uh, environment. Despite there being international standards uh, for what qualifies as tier one or what qualifies as solvency, depending if you're insur in insurance, actually the way that the national regulators operate can vary. So they didn't need to issue permanent shares because their debt still qualified as solvency because they had this um, minimum five-year tie-in um, on their instruments. But they issued 380 million uh, euros worth of, of these bonds last year, and about 100 million of them were, were bought by BlackRock, and the rest were bought by other mutuals. So you can see that you know, there is familiarity in the marketplace with um, working with mutuals. There's people in the room I know who, who issue their own uh, bonds into the marketplace, so they know all this stuff already, but not everybody has, has gone down that route. So I'll just finish with uh, a few observations which might be helpful and to try to set the scene for what we're going to be talking about in designing how it works in Australia. Um, so you're part of a global move. It's not just you doing this as outriders. You're doing it differently, but you're doing it in a way that is reflecting some of the characteristics from uh, other countries. And you can learn about the retail approach. You can learn about the wholesale approach and then adapt it to your own uh, environment. It shows that there is flexibility being offered. People don't want to demutualize. They don't want to do that. They also don't want to stand still. And so doing something different, trying to do it in a meaningful, measured, and organized way is what we're talking about in all these different places. And in every single case, they have been absolutely clear that they should maintain member control and member rights, because that's the reason uh, for a mutual uh, business. Um, there are very different approaches to approaching the wholesale market and the retail market, as you'd expect. Um, there's also different approaches depending on the markets in different countries, too. And liquidity is going to be a key consideration. Um, and so the way in which that you provide um, the opportunity for people to exchange their shares for them to be able to um, uh, transfer them between one another it, it is important uh, as well. So there's a wide variation in these market offers, and that's meant that there's a wide variation in the pricing. So don't just look at one of them and say, oh, we can't do this because nationwide it costs them 10%, because it's not the same everywhere. It all depends on you as an institution, how attractive your offer is, and um, how you package the um, MCI.